freedom is a pure idea. It occurs spontaneously and without instruction. See what the Empire has done to your lives, your families, and your freedom? Good people will fight if we leave them. The rebellion is spreading. Now we take the war to them. The Republic will be reorganized. The systems either change or die. You give way to an enemy this evil with this much power, and you condemn the galaxy to an eternity of submission. And we wake up there is one way of fighting. Stop it. The Empire! Let's call it war. Remember this. Try. You want to know why I'm stalling? Why? Because I don't actually have a joke. You don't have a joke. Okay, I have a couple of jokes that no, I wrote like No, what did Leia ago. say to the Wookiee? Something racist, probably. Welcome to the Daughters of Ferrix podcast. <laughs> Welcome to Daughters of Ferrix, uh, Star Wars politics about politics and politics. I'm your politics, Eleanor Mueller. And I am your um, Sophia Dunstan. So Star Wars draws a lot of visual inspiration from, you know, all these historical influences. But one that can't really be overstated is how much it takes from real world military conflict. This is basic shit, but like especially the world wars one and two. This can be seen in costumes like the ones worn by Republican Imperial officers or trench warfare like on Hoth, Crate or Mimben. And, you know, prop weapons like Han Solo's fucking blaster. It's just it's a kit bashed Mauser C96. Like if you are a person who wants to make a DL44 replica, which I have done, you learn a lot about the C96. <laughs> it just happens. Okay, I'd like to pause here for a moment. You made with your hands a replica of Han Solo's gun. I 3D printed it and put it together and painted it and did like my own like little modifications and stuff. I know a lot my about Han Solo's gun. My perception of your level of nerd just like increased by like 45%. I used to be someone who like did stuff like that a lot. Now most of my like fan community engagement isn't in like writing and discussion but yeah historically i made props because that's what i wanted to go into that's what i wanted to do professionally was i wanted to be like in a production design team anyway a lot of world war one a lot of world war two that's not even to mention the nazis Blasters and uniforms and planets and whatever, all of that aside, where would Star Wars be without its spaceships, without its dogfights, without its fleet battles, without trench runs and Marg's sable? And the aesthetics and the pacing of those is drawn from actual vessels of war. Trench runs are directly inspired by something that actually happened in World War II called dam busting, which is where the Brits would take like, you know, a Lancaster or something like a really big four engine bomber, skim across like at tree level and then over a lake and then just dump this massive bomb right before a dam pull up the dam would just blow and it's quite cool it's well known that lucas both used footage of dogfights for inspiration and like also placeholder footage in a new hope and that has continued to this day this is why ships like x-wings move like that even though it's it's fucking ludicrous in the microgravity environment of space you can't slow down a spaceship by cutting its engines you have to have reverse thrusters look there are like theoretical principles by which cutting power in space would allow your ship to stop but that mostly involves like the kind of warp drives we think might actually be possible where you literally bend space to like form a wave to push you forward even though you're technically not moving because space is moving you're not right you can't drift your x-wing like your poe dameron but i mean x-wings aren't really spaceship in the visual language of star wars they're aircraft they're planes Rebel victory in-universe is credited to their military starfighter doctrine. We talked about this before. The Alliance invested time, money, and engineers into the upkeep of robust, shielded fighters, which essentially allowed their pilots to survive their mistakes more, letting them get better and better in dogfights. That is how it works. Like, there is, like, a tipping point past which you become, like, a much better fighter pilot. Like, there's a reason we don't have, like, as many aces who are just like, I'm a fighter ace, and then just die. <laughs> you get your five kills, and then you freak can keep going until you have like 30 and then you die <laughs> the point is once you've done it for a while you get quite good at murdering people in the sky the alliance also had ships fitted with hyperdrives which meant that they didn't have to use capital ships to ferry them from place to place which is good because they didn't always have those they were expensive so little guys could zip in on a strike mission and zip right out without the need for other expensive infrastructure or engaging in attrition warfare like the empire did which like all of this is 
in contrast to the mass-produced TIE fighters, which are largely treated as shieldless, hyperdriveless, low-visibility death traps. Friend of the show X-Wings in History over on Twitter compared the original trilogy portrayal of the resilient X-Wing versus swarms of disposable TIEs to World War II conflict in the Pacific, drawing a line from the TIE fighter to the Mitsubishi A6M-0 as deployed by Imperial Japan. The Zero seems to have been a pretty good design, but it wasn't as fast as Allied aircraft with their more powerful engines, and it lacked armor to reduce the weight. I mean, to be fair, that's only towards the end of the war because they didn't have an economy anymore. But in the beginning, there was like a clear superiority of Japanese designs over American and other Allied designs. The Zero was a really good plane until you hit like 1943 and suddenly, you know, two years of the most powerful industrial technological complex in the world trying to make a better plane than you, as it turns out, we'll make a better plane than you. Again, stealing from my guy X-Wing, he notes that the TIE swarm idea may also be an extension of the ways in which Americans perceived attacks from the Japanese. Axis forces from Germany were monsters to be defeated, but Japanese soldiers were vermin to be hunted. Japanese planes were understood as shitty and made of rice paper. People in the US talked about the Japanese refusal to surrender, stuff like human wave attacks or kamikaze bombings, as signs of an insane combative spirit. This popular racist idea of Asian people in warfare as disposable, as inferior, as insect-like. I mean, it continued past the 40s. It went into the Korean and Vietnam Wars and beyond. In the 1974 documentary Hearts and Minds, U.S. General William Childs Westmoreland claimed that the Oriental doesn't put the same high price on life as does a Westerner. Life is plentiful. Life is cheap in the Orient. God. The Oriental. (laughs) While there are certainly like cultural and doctrinal differences between us, it's not like a racial thing. Pretty much. You are correct. It's not about that. And so, despite the American allegory baked into the Empire, Star Wars carried with it plenty of American biases, including how the bad guy fought and how the good guy won. Okay, let's pivot away from being the everything is racist show again. Look, I have two podcasts and the simple fact is that both of them are the everything is racist show because everything is racist. (laughs) You would think like, oh, you talk about public transportation and trains. Yeah, as it turns out, everything is racist. Becoming a right wing grifter just so that I can make a podcast about something other than (laughs) racism. Okay, anyway, Sophie, can you tell us about how aircrafts are classified in real world military context? With pleasure. (laughs) Gross. Real world aircraft can be roughly divided into seven different classes based on the roles that they play in any given military action. But we're going to focus on three because of the types that are actually featured in Star Wars. Like we don't have like, I don't know, aerial refueling aircraft. So, I mean, maybe we do, but you don't need fuel for a starfighter as much. You do. As much. But how often do we see them refueling starfighters? Never. But how often do we see Han Solo take a shit? Also, never. That doesn't mean he doesn't do it. Not yet. Um, so fighters, these are the fast, sexy, fancy boys that everyone likes because Top Gun very briefly turned us all into insane American jingoists. Don't deny it. Yeah, me and my excitement for a Rogue Squadron movie, I am not immune to propaganda. So historically, fighters have been divided into multiple types, a division which is reflected in Star Wars, but modern fifth generation aircraft are typically capable of a very broad variety of roles. But since it's relevant to Star Wars, here are some fighter subclasses. Number one, interceptors, very fast very maneuverable, very lightly armed, and designed for defensive action. These are the hot shots of the nuclear part of the Cold War, specifically designed to intercept nuclear armed bombers before they could get to the motherland. Think of like the F-4 Phantom, the, oh, the Eurofighter Typhoon, that's another one of those. F-22 is kind of this, but like adapted for the modern era. It doesn't exist so much anymore, but in Star Wars, they play a very important role. They generally defend ships instead of territory, though. Right. This is the two different types of Jedi interceptors we see in the prequel films. This is TIE interceptors. (laughs) This is why if I ever play an A-Wing in Star Wars Squadrons, I always get killed really fast because I'm a more offensive player. Um, Yeah. Like when you're you're flying an A-Wing, you're supposed to kind of stick close to the mothership or whatever and shoot off anyone who's trying to blow it up but you're not really a match for like actually you know trying to blow up an enemy capital ship unless you ram your entire ship into it (laughs) (laughs) shout out to that one guy whose name i don't know for taking down the ssd executor but like generally these aircraft are not designed to blow up anything except other small fighters this brings us to multi-role aircraft which are kind of the true bad boys of the modern (laughs) avian 
Uh, now we just build planes that can do everything because they're really expensive now. They didn't used to be. Uh, so this is the F-35 in a nutshell and also the X-Wing, uh, right? Very strong fighter to fighter combat capabilities while still maintaining the ability to actually break things that are not other fighters. The most basic thing about me is how much I like an X-Wing. I've tried to like other starfighters more and I just, I can't do it. <sighs> I love the classics. And in the context of Star Wars, this is kind of interesting because there is kind of this debate going on at the moment, whether we should be building planes like this or whether we should be kind of returning to that interceptor philosophy, right? Because, you know, you get your F-35, right? And that thing is very fast, basically undetectable by most radar. It can do almost everything, right? But it costs like a hundred million dollars a pop. There's this kind of idea that if we were to get into an actual war with another, you know, industrialized nation, that we're not going to be able to turn these things out at a high enough rate to keep the war up. So the Empire seems to kind of agree with this school of thought that we should return to simpler aircraft that we can produce more easily because they don't build these. They don't build a proper multi-role starfighter that is widely used. Well, and the First Order actually does. The First Order Special Forces tie probably counts as multi-role. It's a two seater with a hyperdrive deflector shield and what is essentially a torpedo launcher oh it's also got like a turret on the top and let's be clear it isn't the main tie fighter you're going to see in and around a first order capital ship but they do pour more money into these than the empire did the empire had prototype the ties tie with advanced, hyperdrive. but only vader ever gets those really well some other guys do later but yeah pretty much so what you would call like a tie fighter is something like a light fighter which is essentially a way of saying that it's the cheapest possible military effect vehicle. Um, in US terms, this might be the F-16, which is like the most widely used modern fighter plane on the planet. Or the Swedes have this really cool fighter plane called the Gripen, G-R-I-P-E-N. But it can do like crazy short field takeoffs and you can like store it in the woods because the Swedish have this whole really interesting defense strategy where they want to be like completely dispersed in the case of innovation. Anyway. Well, the TIE fighter is, is funny because as far as inspiration goes, it's just a ball with wings. Like, but the I don't know what inspiration inspired that. It's probably, let's make them look different from the like somewhat heroic familiar look of the of the plane inspired X-Wings because you want to be able to tell the two apart at a glance. The TIE fighter sound was directly modified from the sound of German Stuka bombers, which were specifically fitted with these sirens called Jericho trumpets that sound, okay, actually this is an auditory medium. I'm going to put in right here what the Stuka sounds like. So listening to it, there are two things you're hearing. So there's the engine revving up, but then the pilot will go into a dive. And from there, the increase in airflow drives a wooden propeller affixed to the landing gear, which funnels air into a small hole in the siren mechanism, generating the noise. It's designed to be a speed indicator, but it's also meant to harm enemy morale and be used in propaganda. It's, it's pretty intense. It kind of makes you feel like you're being hunted. And you get why they chose this for the Empire, right? Think of that one scene from Andor where the Alkenzi tie zooms over the heads of Cassian's team on Aldani. But yeah, ties aren't bombers unless they're TIE bombers. And this brings us to another exciting type of aircraft, the fighter bomber, <laughs> which is designed to be maneuverable enough to stand a chance in a dogfight. You get like a big bomber, right? Like, a I don't know, a Halifax, a B-17, even like an HE-111, which is kind of like a German medium bomber. And they just can't maneuver because they're so big that if they maneuver at any speed, their wings might shear off. That This is a thing that can happen to large aircraft. So you build these smaller ones, right? And they have some guns on them and they can still carry bombs, but they're fast. And you call this a fighter bomber. And you might say this is like a typhoon, which is a British aircraft or a, a mosquito bomber. The British were really good at building these in the Second World War, actually. And kind of Y wings or B wings or TIE bombers would kind of fill this role, right? Like they can fight not so good, but they can bomb. Well, and I think this distinction matters a lot in the case of the Y wing, because a lot of people who are familiar with starfighters in Star Wars are aware that the Y wing is a bomber and think it just fills every bomber role. And it doesn't. The Y wing is a bit of a bomber and a bit of a fighter. Like, it's good against capital ships, but it doesn't have that much of a payload. As far forward as the NR2 Y-Wing as it shows up in The Rise of Skywalker, at that point, the Y-Wing is kind of a legacy vehicle. It's being reproduced just because people like the aesthetic, and lots of them at that point don't even have ordnance launchers. The Y-Wing's barely a bomber anymore so by then. they just make, like, a fighter variant. Pretty much. Interesting. And some people outfit it with, like, bomb launchers and shit. Like, it's not just not a bomber. 
whatever. But but if you carpet bomb something, you're not doing it with a Y-wing, mm-hmm. basically. We'll come back to this in a sec. Mm-hmm. That brings us to bombers. And we really have a very wide range of variation here, but they're generally designed for large scale destruction of your enemy shit. So think the B-29 Super Fortress, the B-2 Spirit, that's the weird one with the triangles cut out of its back, or the Star Fortress from The Last Jedi. So the MG-100 Star Fortress, as it appears in The Last Jedi, was designed after the manner of the B-29 Super Fortress and the B-17 Flying Fortress, which, I mean, these are heavy bombers developed in the 30s. So the B-17 was like barely entering service when Pearl Harbor happened. And so it was kind of the mainline US bomber for most of the war until you get things like the B-24 or B-25 Liberator and whatever the other one is. And then towards the very end of the war, you get these B-29 Super Fortresses, which are compared to all other bomber aircraft before it, massive and massively powerful, right? Like these things cruise at jet altitudes. They can carry like 20,000 pounds of bombs. They were a real step forward in terms of bomber technology, if you will. The visual language of the dogfight in the film was meant to evoke the idea of crossing the ocean, you know, the expanse of space, and then arriving at the large landmass intended for bombing, you know, the flat gun platform of the First Order dreadnought Fulminatrix. That's its name. I don't know. What does that mean? I don't know. I forgot to Google it. Oh, it means the electrocutor Uh, in a feminine sense. Cunty. I like that, actually. In World War II, U.S. bombing runs flew without an escort a great deal of the time because, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a lot to send out a guy all that way also. But German pilots learned that it was easier to take out or just deter unescorted bombers than the alternative, obviously. So they implemented strategy to match that. In turn, the U.S. Air Force went, okay, how do we not lose as many bombers? Which led to the further development and implementation of longer range escort fighters like the P-38 Lightning or the P-51 Mustang. And also the B-29, which could fly high enough that a lot of German fighters just couldn't reach it. But anyway, this sort of strategy is at least like aesthetically depicted in The Last Jedi. No World War bomber is anywhere near as like noticeably painfully slow as the Star Fortresses in the movie, but the lumbering pace in the battle establishes the clear need for an escort to get the eight bombers into position above the Fulminatrix. And so Resistance Command sends a flight of T-70X wings and RZ-2 A-wings to cover them. A-wings, as we discussed, great at escorting shit. So the real world B-17 was designed to carry a crew of 10. A pilot, a flight engineer, a navigator, a bombardier with a designated seat in the nose of the craft for maximum target visibility. They had this really cool mechanical computer that was like a huge state secret for the United States. So if you crashed your B-17, you were like legally obligated to kill the machine before anything else. So the Germans or the Japanese couldn't figure it out. It was quite cool. It's called the Norden site. A radio operator, two waste gunners, a tail gunner, and a ball turret gunner. Uh, the <laughs> worst fucking ball- job. <laughs> Call me a ball turret gunner the way I... <laughs> Yeah? The way you what? I don't know. I wasn't going anywhere with that. Commit to the bit, Sophie. So, yeah, as Eleanor mentioned, B-17 belly gunners had probably one of the worst jobs on the Allied side of the war, which is saying a lot given that this is a war that killed like 80 million people. So if you've ever seen a B-17, something I've been fortunate enough to do in person and also fly in one, you know that it's a really weird little blister sticking off the bottom with a couple of guns sticking out. This is known as the ball turret. They called it the flying fortress for a reason. Uh, Some models had up to seven turrets. The idea being that it could defend itself from enemy fighters. This proved to be somewhat dubious in practice, but it was a good idea. (laughs) Fighting in the air in World War II era, like there is not much distance. You are really, really close to one another most of the time when you're fighting each other. And so, you know, in modern warfare, you're like you're 20 miles out. So you have some time to react. But if you're trying to gun down a plane that is flying by you like 40 feet away at 500 miles an hour, this is going to be hard. (laughs) You know, there are like bomber crews that became aces. An ace is when you shoot down five enemy aircraft as an aircraft but not many. It also meant that, as Eleanor mentioned, you had just a huge crew, 10 people in total, about half of whom were gunners. But that ball turret in the plane's belly, it was special. First of all, you had to be short enough to fit in it, so gentlemen over 5'6 need not apply. Just like my, uh, my, my hinge profile. Gentlemen of any height need not apply. Anyway. It also made landing somewhat hazardous. Eleanor, in a war, do you think that planes get shot down a lot? I'm gonna go with maybe. 
The answer is yes. Bomber crews had like the shortest life expectancy of any job in the war. And there was like at one point a legal limit on the number of bomber flights they were allowed to make you fly because of how often you would just get killed doing it. Oh my God. Like it was like 25 or something. If you flew that, you were done being a bomber pilot. You could go home. But it never happened because you would just die. But this happens a lot. And crews have to bail out a lot because these things get hit by flak all the time. And so if you're the ball gunner, right, you would think, oh, that's easy. I can just open a little hatch and hop out the bottom. Wrong -o because your parachute is in the fuselage of the plane. So you have to crawl up into the plane and grab your parachute and then jump out. And so you were probably not bailing out. If there was a water landing, which happens occasionally as well, because like England is across the ocean from Germany. <laughs> good luck. Yeah, it's over at that point. It's fucking over. Uh, these ball turrets were supposed to be waterproof, but they were not. But the worst part of being a ball gunner, right, is the ball turret had to be retracted back into the plane for a safe landing, but the mechanism broke quite frequently. So imagine you get hit by flak, which happens a lot because you're bombing cities with people still in them. And the person who you are bombing does generally not like that. So they will they will flack you. And even more common than being just, you know, outright shot down by this sort of thing is having your hydraulics hit and not being able to put down your landing gear. Hmm. And so if you're a ball turret gunner and you want to get back into the aircraft, you have to retract the ball turret so that you can get into the aircraft and also the plane can just land. But when that doesn't happen, you as a ball turret gunner are stuck in the turret as the plane makes a belly landing, turning you into what could be politely defined as paste. And then also another great thing, you can only see below you, which meant that you would often just get killed from behind. You know, you're like looking down like, is there a Messerschmitt 109 down there? I'm going to shoot that sucker down. And then you're just not looking like around you because you can't see. And then some like German son of a bitch comes up behind you and shoots you the fuck down. There's even like a poem about this. Some guy who was a ball turret gunner and I believe survived, which is not common. He wrote a poem. It's called The Death of the Ball Turret Gunner. It's by Randall Jarrell. From my mother's sleep, I fell into the state, and I hunched in its belly till my wet fur froze. Six miles from earth, loosed from its dream of life, I woke the black flack and the nightmare fighters. When I died, they washed me out of the turret with a hose. Seems less than ideal. So anyway, the Star Fortress crew is similar to the B-17s, though, you know, slightly pared down. A pilot, a flight engineer, a bombardier with a targeting pedestal far above the bay doors, and two gunners, each with designated ball turrets at the underside of the craft, which are a touch exposed, but I mean, it's space warfare, so it seems a, a degree less horrible than the B-17. There's a pretty sizable door to get back onto the rest of the ship. It's still probably the worst job on the well, ship. And also, you have to climb through the giant bomb room. Only the bottom ball turret. The top ball turret has it good. Anyway, critical support to Paige Tico for being the uh, the Star Fortress uh, god, the Cobalt Hammer belly gunner. It is notable here that the Star Fortress is a dedicated bomber as opposed to the Y-Wing. A popular criticism of The Last Jedi was, well, why didn't they just use Y-Wing? Because Y-Wing can't blow that shit up. And that takes a lot of ordnance to blow a ship that big up. Y-Wing has like three total glowy purple proton bombs <laughs> flying behind it in the Death Star 2 <laughs> level. It doesn't have, you know, I, I don't know racks, how many. The yeah. racks of just like high explosive. Graffitied, massive ass bombs. And they you just arm them. I love how they fall. That is the coolest scene good. in that entire movie. It's very good. Honestly, the Star Fortress, right? It's just a fun little guy. I'm a big fan of it. But it reminds me more of a B-29 than a B-17 or maybe even like a B-52 just because of how powerful this thing thing is. Aesthetically, it seems quite similar to a B-17, especially with like <laughs> the little... <laughs> Once you take off the giant ass magazine clip on the bottom. But I think in terms of capabilities, I'm honestly going to say it might be B-52. And if you do not understand the capabilities of the B-52, you should be scared. This thing is a country leveler, right? Like you send out one of these things that can level a, a small country, very small country, but a country. Liechtenstein versus B-52, I think we know who's going to win. It can carry like 40,000 pounds of like gravity ordnance or 36 nuclear missiles. <laughs> They well, not used. nuclear missiles, nuclear warheads, I should say, but still. They should have used that in The Last Jedi. <laughs> These things are very powerful, and they are so powerful that we built them in the 1950s and we're keeping them around because nobody's managed to design a suitable replacement for them yet. 
So the last category of aircraft is what you would call a support aircraft. And so you can think of like a Huey, you know, those kind of helicopters that they had in Vietnam where they would like lift you in and out of places and like occasionally have a guy with a really big machine gun shooting out the side or a Black Hawk, also an A-10, which you're probably familiar with as the one that goes. Yeah, um, really helpful description there, Sophie. Well, people will know what that means. I don't um, know what that means. So they're able to provide troops and slash or air support. The closest thing we get to this is kind of a U wing in Star Wars? Like. Well, that's that's absolutely what the Ewing does, but that's also the TIE Reaper, which is an attack lander that serves as air support and a dropship. And of course, the LAAT fulfills this role in abundance. <gasps> oh, I completely forgotten about, how did I forget about Republic gunship things? Those are yeah. cool. They have models that are both designed for troop transport. And for messing shit up. No, and, and also for holding and deploying ATTEs. Oh yeah, that is a thing you can do with, you know those helicopters that have two blades, right? The Chinook ones. Those are designed to lift a tank and move it somewhere else. The Republic gunship is based off of a helicopter and I can't remember which one. I think it's the Hind. Yeah, it's the Hind. It's the yeah. Russian one. Yeah. The one thing about the Russians compared to the United States in terms of like military capability is that there was a long time that they had better helicopters than us. They don't need more because they don't have any money, but... Anyway, so starfighters in Star Wars are treated like planes. Common knowledge, not blowing any minds there. But of course, there is a corollary. Sometimes you might want to help your starfighter get around. And for that, you have to have carriers. And hell, sometimes you're not using fighters at all. And that's where capital ships come in. ISDs, Von Calamari cruisers, Lucre Hulks. Star Wars loves naval combat because in the aesthetic language of the series, our favorite big spaceships are written to be like battleships, aircraft carriers, and other big ass seafaring vessels. You can't see this because this is a podcast, but I am grinning like an absolute psychopath right now. This is like, this is my thing. It is my belief that every trans femme gets up to one military fixation. <laughs> I have none. This episode was hard for me, but Sophie has two. Sophie has uh, has gone above the Look, quota. it is podcast lore that I almost joined the Navy and I did that for a reason. Anyway, Sophie really said boats. So oh, I love boats. Kind of in the beginning stages of World War II, there was kind of this ongoing argument, especially in the British Navy, which was still the most powerful in the world at that point, as to whether carriers were going to amount to anything. You know, there's all these old battleship guys who have been like studying the last 300 years of battleship history and are like, these carriers are so city and I am don't like them. Battleships will forever be the way of doing things. I am that guy. Okay. You are literally that guy. I think carriers are stupid and we should return. But moving on from that, so in a proper ship to ship, engagement in Star Wars, none of that rebel hit and run tomfoolery. <laughs> Star Wars starships behave more like ships of the line or battleships than modern naval vessels because modern naval vessels do all of their fighting from very far away with missiles or with airplanes. Whereas in Star Wars, if you're having a proper ship to ship fight, you get right up next to one another and you blow the shit out of each other. <laughs> we see this, I think, most clearly in kind of that beginning scenes of Revenge of the Sith where like the Venator and whatever kind of ship it is from the CIS side just line up next to each other and just blow the fuck away at each other. So we want to understand like why do battleships fight this way? Why do these kind of heavy capital ships do that as opposed to like ramming one another? Which was for most of naval history, I should mention, the dominant way of fighting other ships. <laughs> You're kidding. I am not kidding. For most of naval history, how you would have like an actual ship battle is you would get a bunch of rowers in your ship and you would put like a big metal spike on, <laughs> on the front of your ship just below the waterline and then you would ram into a different guy. That's bullshit. I don't, you should study like Roman and Greek era naval warfare because it is the funniest shit. You will sometimes ram into the other ship and it will sink, but you can't get out of it. <laughs> your ship will also sink. So naval warfare didn't get that interesting until we invented this wonderful thing called the cannon. <laughs> Are we pro-cannon on Daughters of Ferex? I mean, it certainly allowed the lustful Turk to take Constantinople, so... So we must be for it. <laughs> so as we kind of, you know, invent the cannon, right, and we're thinking about new ways of doing naval warfare, we invent over time what's called the ship of the line, right? And the ship of the line is what you think of when you think of Pirates of the Caribbean, right? You remember that real big ship that they try and steal from the harbor in the Black Pearl, the really big one? Mm -hmm. That is a first 
first rate ship of the line. It has, you know, four decks with guns sticking out and it has probably like 98 guns on it or something. And these develop and, you know, they have different ra- what they call rates of them. Like a sixth rate ship of the line is going to have like 36 guns, whereas a first rate is going to have 98 or more. And so we develop these and how they fight is what you see in Star Wars. They line up next to each other and blow the fuck out of each other. <laughs> Like point blank, like with grape shot. The United States actually built the largest one of these ever, surprisingly. (laughs) Shocker. Surprisingly, actually, since before like the 1900s, we were not that much of a naval power. But it was the USS Pennsylvania. It had 140 guns on four decks, 70 per side. And you would fire all of these at once. So this thing presumably killed a lot of Confederates because it was built in the 1830s, you know, based. Critical support to the USS Pennsylvania. Speaking of the Civil War, right, as we get into the Civil War, we're kind of developing technology and we're having this thing called the Industrial Revolution. And so we build these things called ironclads, the first of which to engage in combat are the Monitor and the Merrimack. The Monitor is the Union one. The Merrimack is the Confederacies. Chad versus Virgin. Correct. The Monitor would go on to be one of the most famous ships in history and the Merrimack would be one one of like three that the Confederacy ever built. The Union built like a hundred monitors. They had the first large ironclad fleet in the world. But these two ships, right, they meet up in this harbor and they just go at it for like eight hours and Hot. neither of them can hurt each other because cannons are not powerful enough to break through iron yet. <laughs> so they just kind of go at it and then and then leave. That's the fucking point, man. Just go home. Um Eight but hours. Kind of the realization of this leads to this real revolution in naval gunnery where you build guns that can get through iron and you attach them to ships. And that's how you get a battleship, which evolves kind of from the 1880s onwards to be kind of these relatively large ships with a lot of iron and a just big, big guns like 10, 13, 14, eventually like 18 inch guns. And then in 1906, you get the HMS Dreadnought, which is such a leap above all the other ones that everyone has to scrap all their old battleships and start building new ones. And this is eventually what causes uh, World War One. Battleship is a strategy type guessing game for two players. (laughs) It is played on ruled grids (laughs) on which each player's fleet of warships are marked. Um... I can keep going if you want. But the point being, when you get to World War One, you have these dreadnoughts, what they're called, the kind of modern battleship, which I think you can probably imagine what this looks like in your head, right? Ugly. It's a long ship. It's got a weird tall thing in the middle. And then on either end, it has a couple sets of real big gun turrets. Ugly as hell. Very ugly. And these are kind of the natural evolution of this ship of the line concept, right? Because the way to get the best firepower on this ship is to be on one side or the other of it, because you can turn all these guns to focus on one point and you get what's called a broadside. And so the entire point of battleship tactics becomes to do what is called crossing the T. Because how you fight with these sort of ships, with these ships of the line or these battleships, is you 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 line them up in a big line. Like all of your ships, your entire fleet is in one really long line. And then you hammer away at each other. But if one team can get in front of the other team, as opposed to a side, then the team that has their T crossed is screwed, right? Because they can only use their front guns. Mm-hmm. Whereas... Which is Way less. Which is a lot less. <laughs> and the, th- the thing about boats is they have to be shaped a certain way. <laughs> right. It's like you can't a- have like a square boat. <laughs> yeah, it's not like a Star Destroyer, which has four sides. <laughs> kind of some famous examples of this. I don't know if you've heard of the Battle of Trafalgar. The Brits are still extremely proud of this because it is the most stunning naval victory in history, basically. And Nelson, he gets right in the middle of the Spanish battle line. So like he crosses their T in the middle instead of on top and he just shoots away and hammers them on both sides with like his entire fleet and they get crushed. Or the Battle of the Jutland, which is like, if you're a battleship nerd, the Battle of Jutland is like your favorite moment in history because it is the only time in history when like two pro Proper fleets of dreadnought battleships <laughs> go at it. So you have these guys for hundreds of years just like jacking themselves off over this idea of all of these ships coming together. Like this is the ideal form and it's happened like once. It happened once because it ruined the Germans because they got their T cross and they were never able to mount an offensive against the British fleet again. Uh, taking my anti-androgens, call it getting my T crossed. <laughs> but now we don't have battleships anymore because airplanes. As it turns out, battleships are are big, very big. Like the largest ones that we will build as the United States are about a thousand feet long. So when you have something that big and you have airplanes, it's really, really easy to hit from the air. And so you can stick like a bazillion anti-air guns on it and it's still not going to be enough. And you can do what the Americans eventually end up doing in World War II, which is bracketing your fire where you will have like hundred ships, right? You have like five battleships in the middle, four carriers, ton of cruisers, ton of destroyers, ton of support ships, and you'll have them all lined out and they will bracket their fire so that like the entire sky is just filled 
filled with flak. Uh, and this still won't stop the Japanese from blowing up battleships because as it turns out, they're just really easy to hit from the air. As we develop things like missiles, we don't need giant guns that can shoot for 30 miles anymore. As cool as that is. Um, and so we start retiring battleships. The last one ever built is the HMS Vanguard. It's a British battleship. It has 16 inch guns. It's scrapped in the 60s. The US keeps our battleships a lot longer because we're cool. Um, <laughs> is that why? No, it's because of Ronald Reagan. <laughs> That's definitely not because we're cool. In the 80s, we had this stupid paranoia that the U.S. had that the Soviet Union was overtaking us in naval power. And so Reagan and his administration came up with this plan called the 600 ship fleet. We previously had like 360, which is a lot of ships, but not 600. And so they just like dredge up every ancient weird ship sitting in dry docks. Just to get to the number 600. To get to the number 600. And so the USS Iowa, the USS Missouri, and the USS New Jersey, which are the last surviving like serviceable battleships, get refitted with like missile launchers and made into to modern warships and then never use because they're battleships and they aren't good for anything. But we do have them. We don't because they were scrapped in the 2000s and made into museums. But we don't have them. I've been on some of those. They're cool. Yeah. They are kind of neat. I'll give you that. Yeah. And the idea of a 16 inch gun is like quite terrifying to me because they would throw things that weigh like two cars just at each <laughs> other. Um, But kind of the point of going into all this detail is to kind of explain why Star Wars ships are shaped the way that they are, right? So because they float on water. <laughs> no. So battleships are shaped the way they are because you want to concentrate the maximum amount of firepower in one direction. And Star Wars ships are largely the same. This is why we get the super weird shape of the Super Star Destroyer, which is just like a wedge. Why isn't it a square? I mean, I know why it's not a square aesthetically, but would it work better if it were a square? Absolutely not. It's really good shape because what you get with this kind of wedge shape is, right, you can focus every gun on the entire ship on whatever is in front of the Star Destroyer. This is why Star Destroyers always try and present their front to the enemy as opposed to their side because when their front is at the enemy they can aim every single gun on the entire ship at whoever they're pointed at the rebel cruisers actually have the opposite design criteria where their fields of fire are best when they're broadsiding something like a regular battleship so this is kind of why star destroyers are the way they are is because you know you want to be able to d just blast that guy blast him <laughs> so if you ever see a star warship and you're like oh that's just shaped that way because george lucas thinks it was cool yes yeah. but also it did turn out pretty well in some cases lucky <laughs> Lucky that we can retroactively have these sorts of conversations and they aren't torn to absolute shit. The point is not that it's the perfect design. The point is that it's a design we can talk about. And there's a philosophy behind it. And it's why we see like kind of the evolution of Star Destroyers in various ways to address their various weaknesses. Like the Venator, right, is not a very powerful ship. It carries a lot of fighters, though, which is a good thing. A thing about the Venator is it has these two bridges and one of them is Starfighter Command and one of them is Ship Command. Man. Crucially, this is important because they get rid of that. <laughs> True. And then the Empire has a very different philosophy of warfare than the Republic does. They don't want to have a lot of like powerful and expensive fighters. They want to just blow shit up. And so they create this new design, which is designed to focus the maximum amount of possible firepower onto a single point. And they do that. And then the First Order kind of bridges the gap. <laughs> they by... do that, but you can't shoot the bridge as good. <laughs> yeah. And also it can carry more fighters. Yeah. The hangar bays are on the entire thing and not just a rectangle on the <laughs> underside. I mean, yeah. In researching this episode, the Resurgent class Star Destroyer has become, I think, my favorite Star Destroyer. I didn't really care about it before, but I like everything it stands for, and I think it looks kind of obnoxious. And uh, it's really good ship. It's, yeah, it's not as sexy as a lot of the other ones. Like, I tend to like a really good-looking ship because I don't, I don't care about all this nonsense. But like, I don't know. It does its job, and it does it good. <laughs> We don't see resurgent class Star Destroyers getting blown up left and right. The Imperial cannot say the same. No, ISDs are extremely easy to pull up because all you have to do is like ram an A-wing through the bridge and... That's an SSD, but God, they really should have thought of that with the SSD too. <laughs> like you'd think that there would be an auxiliary bridge or something where you could like keep the ship from just <gasps> yeeting into the Death Star You from. would think. Regular warships do have multiple bridges. And you probably shouldn't have a big window out to the outside. Well, you probably should have it inside the ship, especially when you have 
have TV. The screens suck. Oh, and here's but the screens an, don't suck more than holograms. Here's another reason why you can tell that bridges in a lot of Star Wars ships are just holdovers of how regular ships work. You know, you always see on every ship, right, even though we don't use sails anymore, a really tall thing. And why is there a really tall thing there? Well, because when you're in the battleship era, how do you blow the other guy up? You see him 30 miles away and you lob one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, twelve 12, <laughs> 12 cars worth of metal at him. And that's how you do it. And that's why you have these really tall things on top of ships so you can see other shit far away and launch something at to blow it up. But when you're in Star Wars, you don't need to do that because you already have all these sensors and you're not reliant on line of sight to blow up the other guy. <laughs> the like. Death Star is the only well-designed Imperial ship because its bridge is a TV. Yeah, it sure does not have anything about the Death Star. It's the only well-designed Imperial <laughs> ship. All right, let's talk about battleship history in Star Wars. So what we have about battleship history and classification in canon is largely included in the book Battles That Changed the Galaxy, where the primary classification system is adapted from its first appearances in books by Jason Fry, including the essential guide to warfare. Fry also worked on battles, so it isn't that surprising to see the system make a comeback here. Moving forward, I'm going to mostly reference the history of capital ships as laid out in Battles That Changed the Galaxy, and therefore in canon, we are going to touch on a bit of legends. They're pretty similar, and there's a lot of cool history about the technological progression of battleships in the Essential Guide to Warfare. I'd have loved to talk about Zim the Despot, the ancient ruler credited with the first great capital ship. I eschewed talking about most of that for the sake of a more cohesive narrative. According to Battles, what we can consider modern capital ship sizes in Star Wars were introduced to the galaxy during the al Sakan conflicts, ushering in what the book calls the Dreadnought Era. In Legends, the al Sakan conflicts began in the year 17,000 BBY. This is ancient, and were characterized characterized by 17 separate clashes across 140 centuries. They were a series of confrontations between Coruscant and the planet Alsaken, wherein, put very simply, they jockeyed for power over their respective major hyperlanes. Hopefully we can talk about it more at a later date. In the last Alsaken conflict around 3000 BBY, the Republic Navy introduced the Invincible class battleship, and Corellian privateers had their own big-ass ships. In canon, apparently this dreadnought era ended when turbo laser technology improved to the point that they could rip apart ray shields. Think the sort of shields that hold Obi-Wan and Anakin at the beginning of Revenge of the Sith, less powerful than deflector shields. So it was pretty much pointless to make ships that big because shields wouldn't really defend them. But shield tech improved too, and ships could be bigger and more well defended. And this is where we see Republic restrictions on anything that would be classed above a cruiser, which is basically anything longer than 600 meters. Just a sec here, because 600 meters is really long. The, the largest ships ever built are like 300 meters long. We will come back to the size thing at the end of the episode. <laughs> anyway, these restrictions come in legends as a part of the Rusan Reformation, a thousand years before the Battle of Yavin, alongside a ship classification system that wasn't designed for anything bigger than the legal limit. But towards the time of the prequels, the wealthy started to just ignore those regulations and the Republic didn't enforce them. Corporate entities and well-off planets would build big-ass battleships for protection, which shipwrights and their corporations benefited greatly from. The military-industrial complex exists in Star Wars, too. Oh, certainly. And then the Clone Wars happened. Hey, did you hear the Clone Wars happened? I did not hear that, but I'm glad I have now. The Republic Navy was almost entirely commissioned from Quat drive yards, and while some ships that comprised Separatist fleets were already in use before war broke out, still others were commissioned from CIS-aligned companies like FreeDAC Volunteers Engineering Corps. And so, among such such monstrosities as General Grievous's 4.8 kilometer flagship, the Malevolence, a bunch of nerds sat down to establish the Anaxes War College System, which would be taught to military cadets for the foreseeable future. Instituted by the eponymous Anaxes Republic Navy War College to add to the existing ship nomenclature, we see seven categories of capital ships, largely based around size, but meant to be somewhat flexible according to a ship's role and weapons. The longtime galactic consensus is that a capital ship is any military craft above a hundred meters. I think that's a dumb classification. The Tandiv IV is not a capital ship. Tandiv 4. Like, that is that is a screen. That is a support vessel. It's not... Like, the point of a capital ship in naval terminology is that this is the firepower. This is the ship that can actually blow shit up. Versus, you know, you have all these smaller ships which are around you to screen you from enemy fire. That's why it's called a screen. Or to support you in some way. So, like, having freaking tiny little baby ship be a capital ship, even though it doesn't play anything like that role, that, that 
that's silly. That's silly. Can I tell you definitely why that's what a capital ship is? Why is that? Think of it this way. A starfighter is any ship you play as when you're playing something like X-Wing or Squadrons. <laughs> and a capital ship is the stuff that you play as when you're playing like Empire the tabletop or, game. Yeah, yeah, Armada. That's what it is. Is it's going, these are the little ones and these are the big ones. Because with toys, the Tantiv 4 is not equivalent in size to the Star Destroyer, but like it's the same. It's the same. It's a big one that's multiple people as opposed to the small ones with one guy in them. <sighs> <sighs> I think it's a toy thing. But, it is a toy thing. But I will say, okay, in order from generally smallest to definitely largest, the Anaxi's ship types are corvettes, frigates, cruisers, heavy cruisers, destroyers, battle cruisers, and dreadnoughts. But each of those fall into larger categories of gunships, cruisers, and battleships. I think what you would want to classify as a capital ship for its role, the battleship category exists for in Star Wars. I think that's what that's doing. I mean, the thing about a capital ship, though, is it doesn't have to be doing the damage itself. A carrier is a capital ship. So I don't know. Anyway, we'll come back to some of those. But let's highlight how, frankly, a lot of these terms are applied kind of just for the sake of having a system during wartime. And not everyone uses them. The category battle cruiser, for example, includes the New Republic Starhawk the Sith Eternal's Zistin-class Star Destroyer, both similar lengths to one another, as well as the First Order favorite Resurgent-class Star Destroyer and the MC-85 Star Cruiser, the Raddus from The Last Jedi. A lot of these ships are definitely a result of an attempt to one-up the old Imperial class. The Resurgent class especially is probably intentionally in direct violation of the galactic concordance limits placed on ship sizes, which were also responsible for the early decommissioning of the Raddus from the New Republic home fleet. Anyway, not, not the point. That's the battle cruiser according to Anaxes. But the Chiss Ascendant uses battle cruiser to refer to pretty much any mid-sized warship that the Chiss expansionary defense fleet was unfamiliar with. So to any Chiss in the audience, your mileage may vary. This kind of stuff always makes me think of that XKCD comic where it's all, there are 14 competing standards. That's ridiculous. We need to develop a single universal standard. And then there are 15 competing standards. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sophie, would you tell us how real world ship classification works? Oh, I would be so delighted. So carriers are what you imagine. You know, only real major surface combatants we have on the modern naval battlefield and only the US and UK build the really big ones. But when they do, these suckers are huge and can anchor entire fleets by themselves. Some carry up to 60 jet aircraft. Uh, we really don't have anything like them in Star Wars because most Star Wars carriers are more like amphibious assault ships than mainline carriers. But the Quasar Fire carrier cruiser thing that we see in Rebels is analogous to the <laughs> Admiral Kuznetsov, which is a Russian carrier cruiser. Um, sure. In the case of the Russian one, it's for political reasons because you're not allowed to take a carrier over 15,000 tons through the Dardanelles, you know, the straits where Turkey is between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean Sea, you're not mm -hmm. allowed to take a carrier over 15,000 tons of displacement through there. So they made a thing with a different name? So they made a carrier cruiser, which is a carrier with a big gun on it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Russia, for inventing that. As I mentioned a moment ago, amphibious assault ships, they're like an aircraft carrier, but smaller and normally carry like 1,800 Marines around just in case the U.S. needs to invade a small country real quick. Yeah, just in case. These are basically mobile platforms for launching an amphibious assault quickly with air support built in. They're very analogous to things like Lukerholtz, Venator-class ships, or a lot of other like you would call like carrier sort of ships in Star Wars. Yeah, it's kind of cute to think of the Lucre Hulk as amphibious because you have the ball on Geonosis and it going up. Well, and, and also if you just think about the role that the Lucre Hulk normally plays is to land a lot of troops. It's not a main combat element. It's a troop yeah. lander. Yeah, because it can carry a lot of shit. So this moves us on to cruisers. And historically, cruisers were really big gunships um, providing supporting fire to bigger surface elements. So in kind of the idealized battleship battle that we were talking about earlier, what a cruiser does is it kills destroyers because destroyers try and get in and like torpedo battleships and like cause all sorts of a mess. So what a cruiser does is it destroys those, it destroys other cruisers and it destroys support ships. These days, cruisers are actually kind of like taking over what battleships did before and be coming like the main surface provider of firepower. So what a modern cruiser will have is just like a shit ton of missiles that it can launch really, really quickly. In Star Wars, lots of ships, like lots, get called cruisers. But according to Anaxi's War College, it's broadly ships that fall between 400 and 600 meters. The Aquatons class light cruiser would probably fall into this category considering how it's used. But she's fucking tiny at 325 meters. So again, it's all a bit bullshit. But it's really a category of 
lighter cruisers. There is historically a division between heavy cruisers and light cruisers because once again, in our idealized battleship battle, right? What destroys the cruisers? Well, you build a heavy cruiser and the heavy cruiser destroys the light cruiser. The light cruiser destroys the destroyer. The destroyer tries to kill everything else with torpedoes and the battleship just wham at each other until they die. It's rock, paper, scissors, but on the ocean and obscenely basically. horrible. Basically. So what I'm trying to say is cruiser is basically a term for any mid-sized ship. In Star Wars, the ships that I can think of that are kind of closest to this role is like a victory class Star Destroyer. It's a support ship to an Imperial Star Destroyer and it just kind of deals with the smaller ships while the big one kind of focuses on the other stuff. You know, yeah, I guess the victory class has a reason to exist. (laughs) Okay. The the punching bag of the Imperial fleet. Full disclosure, this and the Acclimator are what I use in a cruiser role when I play Empire at War because I like to play the Empire because I think their ships are more fun. So I'll have like my two Star Destroyers or whatever that I bring with me in my fleet. And then I'll have a couple victories and a couple acclimators and I'll set my Imperial Star Destroyers after whichever ship of the Rebels is biggest. And then I'll have my little smaller ships deal with their like anti-starfighter ships and stuff. It is very funny to me that I keep bringing up Star Wars Squadrons and Sophie keeps bringing up Empire at War. I don't know what that says, but probably something. It shows that I don't give a shit about boats and she doesn't give a shit about planes. I don't, I don't care about starfighters that much. You are correct. Yeah. I love a starfighter. The political character of a starfighter, right, is kind of anarchist. (laughs) Yeah, sure. Which is probably why you like it. Uh, This brings us to destroyers. There are a lot of things called destroyers in Star Wars. None of them are actually (laughs) destroyers. So in real life, destroyers are what you would call screens, and they work to defend larger and more offensively focused ships from enemy fire attention. Going back to our idealized battleship battle again, your destroyer tries to dart in and uses like smoke screens to obscure the enemy's vision and launches torpedoes at the bigger ships to kind of like distract them and just kind of darts around and does weird shit. It's kind of almost what an A-wing does to like a Mon Calamari ship, right? Like it goes around and tries to like keep the enemy ships off the big ship and stuff. Modern destroyers are also not really what the historical destroyer would be either because they don't do that anymore. Destroyers have trended to be a lot more cruiser-like recently. They carry a lot of missiles, but they do kind of maintain that defensive role a lot. Most of them are very anti-aircraft focused, very anti-missile focused, very anti-submarine warfare focused. But the only ships I can think of that actually do this role in Star Wars, you would call corvettes in Star Wars. Like the Tanti V4, right? This is kind of a destroyer. It kind of just is able to go real fast and distract other things and blow up smaller boats and things. But Star Destroyers, I should emphasize, are battleships. <laughs> like, always, they are battleships. They're really heavy-hitting elements. They are not destroyers. And they chose that name because it sounds cool. In the Anaxius systems, Imperial-class Star Destroyers are destroyers because... Of course they are. (sighs) So according to Anaxes, a destroyer is between 1,000 and 2,000 meters long, which, you know, 1,600 meters, the ISD fits right fucking in. Yeah. The MC-80A Home 1 from Return of the Jedi and the Venator class from Revenge of the Sith both qualify despite being a few hundred meters smaller, though they could also be considered heavy cruisers, which I think is a more likely class to be given to something like the Home 1. There's a cute little detail about destroyer as a classification in the Essential Guide to Warfare that it's actually a controversial pick on the part of Anaxes War College because the name Star Destroyer is essentially a mark of Quat Driveyard's branding that the term was less elegant and more corporate. That is actually quite funny, I think, because like we mentioned, the HMS Dreadnought in 1906 was so good that they changed the name of the type of ship that they produced, modeled (laughs) after that ship, to Dreadnoughts, to what you would think of as a modern battleship. Right. When a lot of people in Naval Command are already using the term destroyer to refer to any massive ship, it's like how some people use the name Hoover to refer to any vacuum. It's a specific brand, but I don't know, that's the name. So the invisible hand from Revenge of the Sith is technically a destroyer. (sighs) Yeah. This brings us to frigates, which do kind of the same thing as destroyers, but are like more defensively focused even. Like they don't have as many offensive capabilities. They just defend the fleet from aircraft attacks and defend the fleet from missile attacks. And corvettes historically are kind of like an escort vessel, which actually there is for once a similarity (laughs) to in Star Wars. They just kind of destroyed submarines. They destroyed raiders, which is what corvettes do in Star Wars. Well, and in Star Wars, corvettes Corvettes and frigates are, again, according to Anaxes, ships that fall between 200 and 400 meters long. 200 to 300 is a, is a Corvette. Oh, great. 400 so the, is a frigate. So the size of the IJN Yamato, the largest battleship ever built, is a frigate. <laughs> 
But yeah, that's that's the Tanty V4. That's the consular class Republic ship at the beginning of Phantom Menace. That's the Imperial That's a Corvette, Raider. yeah. And then that brings us submarines, which are just raiders in Star Wars. In the real yeah. world, there are so many different things that submarines do these days that it's nuts. Several countries' entire nuclear arsenals are just submarines. So there, there's a whole wide array of submarines, and we're not going to get into that because it's not that um, relevant to Star Wars. And then the last one, there are no battleships in modern warfare. Anyone who tells you otherwise doesn't actually know anything about naval warfare. These were retired largely in the 1960s as we developed things like missiles and realized that aircraft carriers are kind of the wave of the future. The very last one was retired in like the late 90s, but these were historically the main surface combatant of days gone by, carrying huge guns with a lot of firepower, generally able to destroy other ships real quick, real easy. These are kind of still important in Star Wars, not kind of, they are still important in Star Wars. Star Destroyers do this. They are the thing. They're the thing because Star Wars naval combat is much easier than real world naval combat. It's a lot less technological in a lot of ways <laughs> because you just line up the big shooty thing and shoot at each other. Yeah. Whereas in real modern naval combat, you can fight over hundreds of square miles and not see each other and just launch missiles at each other and shoot down the missiles with like those crazy tracking Gatling gun things and also submarines, which add a whole new other dimension. So basically why people like Star Wars naval combat so much is because it is in a lot of ways that kind of idealized battleship combat we were talking about earlier, right? You just line them up and blast the fuck out of one another. Other. Yeah. You even see it. Remember how we were talking about the line of battle earlier and how it's important how you line up your battleships and you even see that in like The Last Jedi. All those ships in a single line facing a different direction obviously because Star Destroyers as we discussed have that forward field of fire but they line up so they can focus all the firepower from the entire fleet on the single point. Blockade moment. Blockade moment. So there are obviously ships that fill all these roles in Star Wars but the problem with classifying them in the same way as you classify naval ships is one as we discussed a second ago the the type of combat they're doing in the modern era is much different. Modern naval warfare is almost entirely theoretical because no one's ever done it because there hasn't been a great power war in 80 years. It's just much more fast paced. It's much more technological. You don't just line up and shoot each other with guns anymore, unfortunately. And then obviously it's that they just chose what they thought would sound cool when they named <laughs> most of their ships. Like a Star Destroyer is not called a Star Destroyer because it has anything to do with destroyers. It's called a Star Destroyer because the term Star Destroyer sounds like this real cool spaceship right it's big ship in space that's yeah. that's what the name means uh-huh and then you know finally the scales are way off <laughs> like your smallest star wars ship is going to be as large as the largest warships ever built to hammer home that point, let's talk about the last and largest Anaxes classification, that anything over 5,000 meters was considered a dreadnought. They're trying to classify this monstrosity in the same way that they would classify... Okay, let's say you have your regular battleship, right? The HMS Dreadnought. Big ship, a lot of guns, does a lot of damage. You would have to build something that is like a half mile long with like 40 20 inch <laughs> guns to classify like what a Star Destroyer is to a Super Star Destroyer. The class of ships that you call Dreadnoughts in Star Wars has never existed in the real world. Should never exist in the I real mean, world. I would love one of these to exist because it's completely useless. It's, 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 it's completely nice useless presence. at this point. Oh, somebody's suddenly very concerned about the U.S. defense budget. I'm worried about the U.S. having a defense budget. <laughs> no defense. <laughs> Me when I'm playing A Wing in Star Wars Squadron. <laughs> All right. So the Dreadnought classification in Star Wars obviously includes the First Order's Mandator 4 class Siege Dreadnoughts, which is the sequel to a line of three prior Republic and Imperial Mandator class Dreadnoughts at seven and a half thousand meters long. <laughs> okay. Seven and a half thousand meters is the distance between me and my house at the moment. That's not even seven kilometers. Your house to my house. We recorded Eleanor's house. Her house to my house is not seven kilometers. And that is like 25 city blocks. Our apartments don't get delusions of grand. Andor. It's like 25 city blocks, Salt Lake City blocks, by the way, which are the largest in the world. H horrifically big. Yeah. And it's not long enough. <laughs> Truly the Mandator 4 class siege dreadnoughts of city blocks. <laughs> hey, I'm trying to do the American thing and measure it in football fields. 70 football fields. <laughs> Great. A number that really helps me conceptualize it. <laughs> All right. At seven and a half thousand meters long, it has the firepower of over a dozen destroyers and a big fuck ass ventral gun for orbital bombardment. This thing was designed for full on planetary assault. 
Uh, the first order made at least two, which is too many. <laughs> a step up from that and a few decades before, after the Battle of Yavin and the destruction of the first Death Star, the Galactic Empire rolled out the Super Star Destroyer label, which was applied to 13 Executor Class Star Dreadnoughts, 19,000 meters long, <laughs> nearly the length of Manhattan Island end to end. Seemingly the single largest capital ships introduced at that point. The Super Star Destroyer was designed to symbolize the sheer might of the empire over its citizens and was, as a consequence, arguably too fucking big, <laughs> especially to have 13 of them. 13. I mean, it's a big galaxy, Ollie. Anyway. I mean, and it is kind of funny that there are 13 of them, given that I think the U.S. has 13 aircraft carriers at the moment. It is not impossible that that is deliberate. <laughs> Maybe it's 12. I don't know. It's close anyway. Ronald Reagan saw that the Empire had 13 Super Star Destroyers and was like, we have to get to the 13 number. <laughs> But of course, fascists have to both pay homage to past regimes while also trying to top and prove them ineffective. So the First Order made a single mega class star dreadnought, the comically large Supremacy, mobile capital of the First Order, flagship of the Supreme Leader. This wedge shaped thing was 60 and a half thousand meters wide and 13,000 meters long. It's not just a carrier for gunships, it is also a carrier for other warships, as the Supremacy can dock up to six Resurgent Class Star Destroyers internally and two externally at once. The Mega Class Star Dreadnought is powerful and stupid and imposing and ridiculous all at the same time, and it is probably the single biggest warship in canon galactic history. There is like a point beyond which it becomes just impractical, right? Like this thing has more firepower than a fleet by itself. Is that like entirely necessary or would you want to have more liquid assets where you can like... <laughs> Because you can build like, I don't know, 200 Star Destroyers instead of this thing and you can move them around independently versus this thing, which you have to have by itself and it has to have like 50 supporting Star Destroyers. Otherwise, it is just going to get destroyed by a Starfighter because it's... I doubt it could get destroyed by a Starfighter in any circumstance, but we don't or even... Or it can get Holdo maneuvered. Yeah, well, woman you know, got lucky. She was really like doing a callback to the early history of naval warfare where you would just ram each other. Yeah, uh, she's a big history fan. <laughs> For the record, in Legends, the biggest ship in history might be some Yuuzhan Vong world ships, <laughs> which could get as big. I love that the Yuuzhan Vong finally make an appearance on the podcast. They're my favorite thing from Legends, and I'm still disappointed they didn't use them. You know, someday maybe we'll talk about New Jedi Order. <laughs> World ships can get as big as 120 kilometers across, but also that's kind of insane. And they serve more as like mobile space stations than warships, which means I have to count the Death Star 2, which was 160 kilometers in Legends and 200 kilometers in Canon. And I also got to count fucking Starkiller Base, which was like six and a half hundred kilometers. So I I'm not doing that. I thought Starkiller Base was a proper planet, but I didn't think it was that small. You'll see that a lot. Whenever there's like a, a recorded diameter of a planet, it's usually on the smaller end. Anyway, <sighs> yeah, I'm not talking about Starkiller. I'm not talking about the Death Star. Ugh. The Supremacy is big. The Executor is big. All of these ships are absurdly large and probably a huge waste of resources on the part of the political entities that build them. Maybe just like invest in good so public like, transit on so, Coruscant. So, so like battleships in the pre-World War. People don't realize that World War One was caused by battleships. The reason that England and Germany and France all hated each other's guts is because after England introduced the HMS Dreadnought, they're like, oh, we have these huge fleets of what are literally called now pre-dreadnoughts. <laughs> we had these huge fleets of pre-dreadnoughts. They're battleships, but they're nothing compared to the HMS Dreadnought. So let's use our entire economies to try and build big fleets of dreadnoughts even though we maybe don't need that many. And so the British end up building like 40 and the Germans end up building like 20 and the French have like 15 and everybody just has a shit ton of these things, <laughs> even though as it turns out, they're not that good. <laughs> okay. Have we said our piece on mm -hmm. big ass ships? The thing about Star Wars is that it likes starfighters. Mm -hmm. And I really wish that someday we would get a proper slugfest, a real proper slugfest between some capital ships. I just, that, that would make me very happy. I do think we should get stuff like that on screen. I will also say for anyone interested in that, go read the Thrawn Ascendancy trilogy. It's the best Thrawn trilogy. I said it. Also, probably the most fascist one, but I, I don't know. I'd have to reread it. Anyway, let's answer some emails. 
Our first email is from Charlie Gates. Charlie says, hey, daughters. Are you happy? Are you happy, Sophie? <laughs> Look, my parents are never going to call me it, so I expect strangers on the internet, too. Jesus. All right. <laughs> Charlie says, I adore your podcast. As somebody who was obsessed with the Star Wars Legends canon when I was in middle school and was somewhat disappointed when Disney took the reins, I appreciate you introducing me to a lot of new stuff that I had missed and that add a lot of depth to the new canon. I have a lot of sympathy for that, Charlie. I will occasionally rag on Legends, mostly in its portrayal of women, but there's a lot of good stories from those days, and there's a lot of good world building that is being like pumped into canon reference books and stuff because it's valuable and because that meant a lot to people. I am young enough that my primary into Star Wars was not like 90s era books, but genuinely, like, I can't imagine how it must have felt not seeing some of those stories finished even like genuinely super hard so I appreciate you being open to us sharing some of the stuff from canon the goal is to talk about both canon stuff and legend stuff here I don't have as much of a background in legends what I've read I like but by comparison I've read almost all of canon you know like not comparable no and she means it like she has like literally every canon book here I do not have literally I have read more than I own I would say I have about half of what I've read most of what I haven't read is like kids books and stuff which I want to go back and read, but I just kind of missed. So anyway, I have a lot of sympathy for that. Charlie goes on. I have been reflecting on some of the more recent appearances of Darth Vader, and I can't help but notice that in some stories, such as the official Darth Vader comics that introduced Dr. Aphra, the writers tried to thread a needle between him being this cool, unstoppable badass, as well as a fascist who perpetrates genocide. I don't demand absolute moral certainty from my media, but it would be nice if they could pick a lane. He can be a guy that you get excited for when he does a cool lightsaber thing, or he can be a Reinhardt Heydrich, but he can't be both. Most fascists weren't badasses. A lot of them were people who at any other time or place would be total losers. Cough, Hitler, cough. (laughs) George Lucas did a great job portraying Anakin as the sort of arrogant, self-assured child that would sign up for a fascist government, but a lot of that characterization seems to have flown over the heads of the people writing newer Star Wars content. I would love to hear your thoughts. Thanks for reading, Charlie. I mean, the trouble with this is there is occasionally one fascist who is, unfortunately, a badass. For example, do you know who Otto Skorzeny is? I think we talked about him a couple times ago. I think we did. The Nazi commander who like rescued Mussolini from like a mountain fortress in Italy after the... Yeah. That being said, I do definitely agree with you that like, I don't know, it is a little morally problematic to be like, oh my gosh, Darth Vader, he's such a badass. Oh yeah. And he happens to, you know, participate in an omnicidal regime. I think there's a problem with two primary roots. One... The bad guys in Star Wars look cool. People want to be excited for the bad guys because they look and seem cool. Well, and and like I said, I do play with all the Empire shit in, you know, Empire or because it's more fun than the stupid, boring rebel crap. When Darth Vader marched onto the scene in A New Hope, people thought he was like, whoa, he's bad, but interesting, but red lightsaber. Like, I get that. Like, there is aesthetic appeal to them. And we've talked about this, but to some degree, that is is like kind of fascist propaganda. It's extremely light fascist propaganda, but making fascists look cool is in the interest of fascists. Now, I'm not saying you can't like Darth Vader. It's Darth Vader. He's not real. It's whatever. I just, I think that's part of it. I think the second route is why we're seeing it now. I think it's the Clone Wars. I think that the ways in which people saw Anakin as whiny and arrogant back in the day when the prequels were coming out has been papered over by a much more cocksure capable portrait of Anakin in the Clone Wars, which, let's be clear, is trying to live up to the idea that Luke has of his father in the original trilogy. It's trying to do that. It's trying to be like, why would Obi-Wan feel like Anakin was such a loss when Anakin was just this little shit? And like, Anakin is not horrible in the prequels or anything. He has redeeming qualities. But in the Clone Wars, he is a badass. He is likable. He's charismatic. He's sometimes an asshole, but people like rooting for him, even when he does bad things. And I think that Darth Vader comics, particularly the 2015 and 2020 runs are trying to square that. People like Anakin and people root for Anakin even when he's doing fascism. And I think that's, that is a tendency in the fandom right now, especially in spaces that are really dominated by men. There is a tendency to look at Star Wars as the story of Anakin, a guy who largely was fine or to paper over the bad stuff. And I, uh, it doesn't make me feel great a lot of the time. I'll be honest with you. I get making jokes about bullshit Star Wars stuff, but people make a lot of jokes about that time that Anakin killed those kids. Like, <laughs> there uh, are people 
people are really like, yeah, concerningly not into it, but like concerningly thinking about it. Like I, you know, most days do not think about Anakin, you know, genociding the Tuscans or murdering the younglings. And then there will be people who are just like memeing constantly, like not just the men, but the women and the children too. Or people love getting to youngling make, that bitch. People like to make edgy memes, especially lonely men like to make edgy memes. And like someday we'll go into this more, but that is a space in which fascism thrives in the quasi ironic, intentionally edgy love of stuff that the people around you say is bad. And I think some of the fandom around Darth Vader trends towards that. He is also a badass. Darth Vader's a badass. I get it. I like Darth Vader. But the reason he's a badass is kind of those tendencies, right? We like the Empire sometimes. It's fun. I love watching Dedra Miro be the world's biggest bitch. Girl right. boss, fascist queen. Yeah, I, I do enjoy that. I'm not going to pretend like I don't. That is a little bit concerning. I agree with you, Charlie. It can get weird sometimes. Thank you for your email, Charlie. Our next email is from Joel Davis. Hello again, Joel. Joel says, Hello, Daughters of Ferrix. I have a bit of an interesting political science question this time around. Re-listening to the Palpatine is bad at his job episode, I remember you guys were almost not sure if the Empire was technically fascist or just an authoritarian government before getting into the comp nor human supremacy stuff. Though it did get me thinking, in the context of first just the original three films, is there enough of an argument to say the Empire is fascist in a political science sense of the term? Since some of the most overtly fascistic elements come from, as you say, the text. Secondly, can you say the Empire is fascist when including the newer on-screen materials like Rebels, Rogue One, and or Solo, etc.? I just think it's interesting how we can view Star Wars with the paratext and without, and if certain political definitions can stick or not. Ultimately, the Empire are still the bad guys regardless and deserve a good punch in the face. Love the podcast. Thanks for taking my question again. Joel Davis. So, as you said, without the paratext, the Empire is not fascist. The Empire is a weird authoritarian regime that kills a lot of people, but it is not what we would call fascist fascist in a strictly political sense, because there is a definition for that. And it's largely defined by right-wing authoritarianism with nationalistic tendencies, basically. And the empire that we see in the three movies is not that. We don't see the racism necessarily, even though it can be kind of implied from the fact that there are only humans around. So I'm going to say just in the three films, not fascist. But when you add in all the extra films and all the paratexts, especially things like Rebels and Andor, it becomes increasingly clear how much of a fascist regime they are. Yeah, if we didn't have the original trilogy and we inexplicably had some newer stuff, they would definitely be fascist. I would contend that it's not as simple as that. What isn't clear if you go back and listen to the first episode of the show, which I don't recommend, sometimes people are like, I'm going to listen to the show. I'm going to start with your first episode. I always go, don't listen to whatever is newest. Please, I'm begging you. The quality (laughs) has improved both auditorily and contentarily. Yeah, topically. But what didn't happen in the first episode is we were going to actually talk about the taxonomy of fascism, stuff like like Umberto Eco, Robert Paxton, and we pretty much didn't. We threw that out because we went over time and I didn't know what I was doing when I was writing the episode. So I think there are certain bits of like Echo's points of fascism or whatever the fuck that are part of the original trilogy. The racism inherent in the Empire is not simply implied. There's stuff like that Imperial officer in the cell block calling Chewie a thing. They, they clearly don't view non-humans as people. There is a contempt for the weak that Palpatine very clearly espouses when he shows up in episode six. And this like obsession with machismo and with like the the like ships and the guns, the rebel stuff is scrappy and whatever. The Imperial stuff is everywhere and varied and expensive and technologically advanced by comparison and, and stuff like that. Echo talks about stuff like a rejection of modernism and a cult of tradition. And I think that's the kind of stuff we only get into when we start to see the Republic in the prequels, but this is why it's dicey. I don't think the Empire in the original trilogy is definitively not fascist, but I do think they check off way fewer of the boxes, let's say. And that's the thing, is that fascism, as much as anything, is a political strategy, way less than an ideology. It's like a way of thinking more than what you think. So no matter what you're doing, it's your homeostatic property cluster of this is the stuff that's kind of within the fascism cluster, you know? It's not like Let's the say Empire. fascism is a half a Venn diagram and the Empire is a Venn diagram. In the three movies, there's a lot of overlap. When we look at everything else, it's a circle. Yeah, <laughs> it's the same picture. Really good question. I do wish we had gotten into that because I think that would have made for a more interesting episode. But, you know, I'm allowed to regret our past work. That's my right. 
Thanks for the email, Joel. If you have any questions, suggestions, or corrections, you can send them to our show email, daughtersferrix at gmail.com. If you want to listen to new episodes as they release every other Wednesday, you can find us on most places you can listen to podcasts on our website, daughtersofferrix.com, or follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at ferrixpod, F-E-R-R-I-X-P-O-D. Feel free to share this episode with anyone you reckon might like it, or rate us wherever you're listening. I've been Eleanor Mueller. You can find me at The Letter Bomber on most platforms. Sophie, where can the lovely people find you? You can find me at Sophia and SLC on Twitter and at my other podcast at the red line underscore pod. It's about public transit and urbanism as discussed today. Our episodes are written and edited by me, Eleanor Mueller, and Sophia Dunstan. Our podcast art is by Jill Mueller. Our intro and outro music was arranged by me with themes by Nicholas Bertel and John Williams. Thanks for listening. Bring back battleships. That's that's your your call for this week. Go to the store, buy a copy of Hasbro's Battleship.